Welcome back to the series on graph neural networks. In the next minutes you will understand how exactly GNNs work internally and which variants exist. Let's quickly recall what we have learned in the previous video. The graph information, including node features and structural properties, is fed through message passing layers. These layers construct the node embeddings that contain the knowledge about other nodes and edges in a compressed format. This is done by gathering the current node information of neighbor nodes, combining it in certain ways to get a new embedding and updating the node features or states with these embeddings. This approach is also called graph convolution and can be seen as an extension of convolutions to graph data. We will see in a second how exactly this works. First let's have a look at this visualization from a paper which shows image convolutions on the left and graph convolutions on the right. For images, you simply slide learnable kernels over the regular grid structure of the pixels, which extracts the most important information. This can also be seen as combining the information in a local area by using all the pixels in this neighborhood. For non-Euclidean graph structures, this idea is extended, as we simply use the information in a node's neighborhood and combine it into a new embedding vector. If we look at the red node in a graph, this simply means that the neighboring nodes share their current embeddings with it. This is done simultaneously for all nodes. This sharing mechanism is also called message passing, as the states can be seen as many messages passing back and forth between the nodes. But now let's have a look at a concrete example to better understand this idea. Let's assume this is our input graph in the following. We see that there is one yellow node with the number 1 with a yellow node feature vector or state. This is the node we will focus on in the following. To update the node state we collect the information of the direct neighbors which means we perform the message passing. What we end up with is the information about our current node state and the information about our neighbors node states. These states are usually denoted with h. Currently we are in time step k. Then we perform an aggregation on the neighbor states to combine their information. Finally we put our current state and the combined neighbor information together to get a new state or embedding in layer k plus 1. Note how some of the feature information of the blue nodes enters the state of the yellow node. Now we update our annotations in the graph. This message passing is done by all nodes and therefore we have new embeddings for every node in our graph. The size of these new embeddings is a hyperparameter and depends on the graph data you use. As you can see, the node with the number 5 only holds information about the blue node and itself, because it's green and blue. Currently this node doesn't know about our yellow node with the number 1. But this will change. Let's perform another message passing step to see what happens. And actually we can perform several of these message passing steps, which corresponds to the number of layers in the GNN. Again we use the current node embedding of our yellow node, collect the state messages of its neighbors and aggregate them in some way. If we update the yellow node's embedding now, we can see that some information about the green node passed into it. This means that node 1 knows something about node 5. But additionally, in our example, every single node in the graph knows something about all other nodes. This knowledge is stored in each of our node embeddings and contains the feature-based as well as structural information about the nodes. Eventually, we can use the embeddings to perform predictions as they contain all the information about the graph that we need. And this is the basic idea of GNNs. We learn these embeddings by iteratively combining the node information in a local neighborhood. Iteratively means we first learn something about the direct neighbors, then about the neighbors' neighbors, and so on. This local feature aggregation can be compared to learnable CNN kernels. We can actually visualize how deep we dive into the graph from each node's perspective. This means we can understand 
which neighbors and neighbor neighbors and so on we learn about. This is usually called the computation graph for a specific node. If we restructure our graph like this, we can automatically see which nodes are the direct neighbors of our yellow node. This means in the first layer of our message passing GNN, the yellow node incorporates information about the blue nodes. Now if we add the direct neighbors for each of these nodes, we can see the next layer. Two of our blue nodes are connected to blue and yellow and the third blue node is connected to green. We can see that after two layers, the yellow node already contains the information about all nodes in the graph. The number of layers in a GNN defines how many neighborhood hops we perform. This number is a hyperparameter and depends on the graph data we use. If you have small graphs, such as smaller molecules, you can quickly learn all the information after only a few layers. The number of layers also depends on the learning task. Sometimes only a local area of the graph might be relevant for your predictions. But stacking too many message passing layers in a GNN can also lead to a phenomenon called oversmoothing. As you see in our previous example, the node embeddings contain most of the information already after the second layer. If you keep combining these states over many more layers, you will not learn anything new, but instead make all node states indistinguishable from each other. There already exist methods such as Paranorm, which can handle these issues, but for now let's assume we have no oversmoothing in our GNN. Let's formulate the operations in the message passing layers more mathematically. The state update for a node U is mainly performed using the two already introduced operations, aggregate and update. Aggregate uses the states of all direct neighbors V of a node U and aggregates them in a specific way. Then the update operation uses the current state in time step k and combines it with the aggregated neighbor states. If we think of our previous example, our node u is the yellow node and its neighbors are the three blue nodes. We use their states in time step k and combine them with the yellow state to get a new embedding for the yellow node. This basic formula stays the same for all variants of message passing graph neural networks. The only thing in which they are different is how they perform the update and aggregate functions. Many different operations have already been published in literature and besides simple mean or max operations, there are more advanced methods like recurrent neural networks. Let's go over some examples. One of the first famous works from Kip van Welling uses two interesting ideas. First of all, they aggregate the neighbor information as a normalized sum of the states. Additionally, they incorporate the update operation into this aggregation by adding a self loop for a particular node including it into the summation. This means update and aggregate are combined into one computation. Another work uses multi-layer perceptrons so basically feed-forward networks to perform the aggregate operation. This means that there are learnable weights which can be optimized for the best aggregation of the neighbor states. Another popular paper applied the attention mechanism to GNNs. This means that the importance of the features of the neighbor states is considered for the aggregation. As a result, the updated embedding contains more information about important neighbor features. Finally, Gated graph neural networks use a recurrent unit to update the state iteratively over time. Besides these introduced variants, there exist many more in the literature. But don't be scared, they all just use different approaches for the aggregate and update function. For now we will conclude the theoretical part and if you are interested in learning more details about graph neural networks, I can recommend this great ebook which is freely available. Thanks for watching and see you in the next part, where we will use PyTorch Geometric to build a simple GNN for molecule data.